<laughs> We're recording. So yeah. what 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 was it what was it that you said? I said your hair is looking especially vibrant today. <laughs> ah. And <laughs> fucking shoot because I applied the green goop to it yesterday. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Also, I think the webcam settings are kind of vibrant right now. <laughs> Light balance, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I uh, I deleted all the uh, all the apps and and drivers that came with it. Like I I mean it does have some generic driver, but I, I deleted all the apps that came with it because they were interfering with the mic work and such. And that means every time the light changes, I need to manually set it up. <laughs> <laughs> and right now it's like. Bright sunny day <laughs> of May, so this means I get to turn the exposure all down to zilch, and uh, and then later when it gets darker, I'm gonna have to notch it up again. Mm. All right. So the idea, the the grand scheme for work today is that uh, we could read the revamped chapter 7 mm -hmm. which uh, otherwise I think is is in the state of ready to be shown for the trusted people uh, there is this last uh, last paragraph or last scene in uh, in chapter six that I need to sort out still that's the solitaire sort of making a way into the station and uh, the environmental analysis and that sort of thing mm -hmm. oops <laughs> 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 so it's, it's not it's not a huge thing I just need to put it together in a sort of tight and purposed manner and uh, I've been working on chapter eight now, which is basically, basically this. It gets easier and easier because it seems that chapter eight we worked on. I think after you had left Estonia, and uh, and chapter eight is kind of closer in its quality to the stuff that comes in part two. But I, I did find some things that I wanted to rework anyway. <laughs> so, where shall we start? I think chapter seven is a good start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can feel my throat is like, there's there's no Lenish voice in there right now. Aww. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've still got mor mor my morning voice on at half two in the afternoon. Okay, so, chapter 7 of Seeker. The stale metallic air gave her the chills as she stepped out. Jewel let her eyes adjust and paced along the set on... Okay, hang on. All prep work. <laughs> yeah! Start doing a hucker. We'll be sweet. The stale metallic air gave her the chills as she stepped out. Jewel let her eyes adjust and paced along the wide central walkway, glancing around, minding the crumbling edges and banister gaps. She headed towards a half-lit plateau further ahead, passing the junctions to empty docking platforms on the way. The bayside lighting strips triggered by her approach emitted a murky glow from their dimmed and broken cells, only making it harder to spot the uneven footing. A voice erupted from the bay speakers. You! What are you doing here? So, there was someone left alive in here, watching. Jewel halted and studied the surroundings in silence. Now that more lights were on, she spotted a heavy circular hatch at the end of the plateau with a simple control panel next to it. Identify yourself! Getting angry, are we? Jewel smirked. She'd already provoked a reaction without having to utter a word. The voice returned to calm with a note of hubris. It matters not. You were dead from the touchdown. Jewel caught preparation noises in the background. Footsteps, muffled orders. She drew into a somewhat shrouded junction corner and fixed her squint on the back wall. The hatch creaked open and a bundle of men emerged, all armed with homemade blunts and sharps. 
their movements rough and uncoordinated. A few stayed by the hatch, and a pack of six headed her way. As they drew closer, Jewel noticed that underneath the baggy jumpsuits, their joints were jutting out, and amidst the scars and bruises, the discoloured skin patches indicated serious nutrients imbalance. She measured the sorry bunch, her hand lingering on the pain maker handle. It had been a while since she'd had a decent brawl, and the temptation was too great. Jewel stood and readied her nightsticks, drawing nervous laughs from the group. Dumb sniff thinks she can hit us with a... Sorry, I need to nail this. It had been a while since she'd had a decent brawl and the temptation was too great. Jewel stood and readied her nightsticks, drawing nervous laughs from the group. Dumb sniff thinks she can hit it with a stick. Jewel kept her eyes open and mouth shut. The leader of the pack, half-nose, Jewel thought, wielded a jagged metal pipe. Dodging his swing, Jewel noticed a tall rat-faced man slipping behind her. She dropped to a crouch and sent the combined force of the stick and her elbow into his gut. Leaving the writhing heap of rat face behind, Jewel rolled away from the group, taking a moment to compose herself. Apart from the two aggressors, the jumpsuit gang didn't seem too eager to jump into the fight. They stood some paces back, rattling their tools, showering her with lengthy and melodic insults that her earworm dubbed with semant semantically accurate strings, dull and literal as only standard galactic could deliver. Half-nose scowled at his, at his flawed comrade and moved in for some more. Jewel braced for the incoming blow, meeting the pipe's impact with enough force to dent her nightsticks. She, she dodged the follow-up swing, caught the pipe's dwindling momentum into the cross sticks, and drove the pipe's mangled end into its owner's brow. She quickly retracted, leaving her opponent's stagger in anger. Agna? <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> um... She dodged the follow-up swing, caught the pipe's dwindling momentum into the cross sticks, and drove the pipe's mangled end into its owner's brow. She quickly retracted, leaving her opponent stagger in anger. When he made an irate charge at her, she gently stepped aside. The prisoner flew forward and took a plunge off the ledge to the, ma to the maintenance level. Valkyrie! Huh? Jewel turned her gaze to the hatch, trying to make sense of the jumpsuit chaos. The group she'd faced was scurrying into safety dragging their unconscious mate along, others hurrying them along, and moving in to assist. One figure didn't flee. He stood by the hatch, arms crossed, visibly better fed and better trained than the others. Jewel forced herself to calm. A former contract of hers must have ended up here somehow. Why wasn't it in the files? When the figure began walking to her, she recognised the gate. This was one of hers indeed, her third catch, Valen Ricks. They told me there was a seeker on board. Someone here knows their enforcement. He kept moving. Had to see for myself. Learned a few new tricks since last time, have we? She stood, sweat dripping, and took some measured breaths, easing herself into an alert stance. He approached and settled in... He settled... Sorry. She stood, sweat dripping, and took some measured breaths, easing herself into an alert stance. He approached and settled to a stance of his own. Jewel saw he was unarmed. You think you're better than me? Think again. I've beaten you once, Rix. You're in here, after all. He sneered at her. I've had a long time to improve the art. What about you? Still hiding away in that stasis jar? He threw the first punch. She had, she had seen it coming. His moves were predictable, training-like. She dodged and landed a blow. He replied by throwing his free arm up under her sternum. Jewel winced at the unexpected impact. She struggled to restore her balance, and after back and forth flurry, slammed one nightstick into his ribs, then back some paces towards Solitaire. Your twigs won't help you! Valen came after her, huffing with anger. They exchanged another training room sequence. Then he advanced with no, me no warning or method, only fury. His wild punches pushed Jewel back, farther and farther, until a heavy blow to the jaw slammed her head to, shuttle to Solitaire's hull. Her dodges failed, and the punches kept coming. Valen shook her by the neck and broke into a wide bloody smile when her sticks clattered onto the walkway, and her eyes glazed over. In the back of her sinking mind, a little voice called out, Jewel, you still have work to do. Are you going to give up on me? It was mocking her. Jewel's eyes shot open in wrathful glare, blooded and feral. She grabbed Valen's arms and, propping her feet against her shuttle, delivered a knee-kick to his chest. 
His gloating moment interrupted. Valen let go and stumbled backward, winded and surprised. Jewel picked up the nightsticks and prowled onward with a fervent scowl. All defiance drained from Valen's face, and fear took over as he backed away, faster and faster. Jewel broke into a run, leaped into the air, and, with a low growl, landed on his chest, smashing the nightsticks into his temples with enough force to dent steel. When she lifted them, bits of skin peeled off. Jewel stepped off the lifeless husk and thought back to the other lives she had on her conscience. This felt... different. Looking inside herself, she found no remorse or sorrow, sorrow, only sense of completion. Her movements slow and deliberate, Jewel displayed herself to the nearest camera. Who's next? The voice on the comms didn't betray much concern. Surely you don't expect to take out the entire station on your own. I have time. Jewel looked straight into the camera. I have weapons. I already took out one of your strongest. There's another one down there. Somewhere. Give me answers or this place gets an unscheduled clean-up. A dry chuckle sounded from the comms. We've sealed the bay hatch and we control the dock mechanisms. Your pathetic shuttle is on lockdown. We shall wait until you starve, Seeker. Or, Jewel stepped up to the hatch, I will override the door controls, find out where you are, come knocking. She pushed her badge to the console. Unless you give me what I want, she let her hand hover over the interface. Do that. I will leave, and you can keep your floating cage all for yourself. Her chills had settled in when the comms finally crackled. Very well. What do you want? Bring me Fortune Harper. Ha! You're too late. That little shit is gone. Shit. He got lucky during the takeover. Managed to take off. The voice carried on. The voice carried on with some wishful mockery. Uh, are you looking to lock him up again? What a cruel twist after he worked so hard to get out. You'd like to hear that, wouldn't you? Jewel kept her face straight. I might, but as long as I'm spending my time here wiping out your friends, he remains out there. Find me someone who knows him. A cellmate, work along, partner, friend, whatever. She had to wait for the reply again. I am reluctantly sending you Lennis Simmel. He and Harper were in the food lab together. Maybe he has something for you. And Seeker... I am not happy about this. The bay fell silent. Jewel returned to solitaire and was relieved to find that the lockdown didn't affect onboard systems. She poured some water on a towel to wipe the blood and sweat. Now that the adrenaline had worn off, her body ached all over, and the head bruises burned to the tune of her pulse. Jewel had learned and trained to manage some level of pain and discomfort. This time, she decided it would be wise to request medical attention before any new encounters. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of hiccups mm -hmm. uh, also I like the idea of nuit sticks <laughs> nuit where? where was that um, yeah where, when she, this bit where she's fighting ra uh, Valen nuit sticks <laughs> that a properly flew apparently Google has no quarrel with it <laughs> <laughs> it's <Nuit>. too busy <laughs> yeah on. it's like Nightsticks is like the lowest level, but uh, but when you upgrade, then you get nightsticks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see. Um, okay, and there was another one. I really like Valen settling into a stance of his own, as opposed to in a stance of his own. Where was that? Oh yeah, he settled. Good. Yeah, into a stance of his own. She stood, sweat dripping, and took some measured breaths, easing herself into an alert stance. He approached and settled into a stance of his own. Jules saw he was unarmed. You think you're better than me? Think again. I've beaten you once, Rix. You're in here after all. Yeah, okay. I think that reads much cleaner. Yeah, I think I can move up, approached, remove approached. He settled into a stance of his own. Yeah. The one issue I've encountered when reading, though, is these um, thoughts... Mm -hmm. in Jules' head are not distinguishably... Uh, dis and this is only in the case of reading. If someone were to read this on the page, they probably wouldn't have a problem, but reading mm -hmm. it out, it's like... Yeah, thought. I was... What? Yeah, I was thinking about it. Uh, would it help if they... if the sort of inner inner voice, inner thoughts would get a line of their own? I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, because I was... Uh, I, I noticed that they, they are not as easily... St 
extinguished, distinguished as I would mm. like. I think the, put, the putting the thoughts on the second line or on a different line separates it enough to show that. I mean, I'd have to take a pause when I'm reading there. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I sort of yeah. run into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, there should be a pause because we are sort of switching into a different camera for a second. Mm. Uh, I wonder how to approach when she's... Uh, when she's labeling or giving names to the uh, to the prisoners, like uh, flat nose or half nose was uh, mm. was the one that she sort of names directly. Mm. So I think yeah here uh, I will I will leave it within the sentence but I will I will uh, I will keep it in italics if it's if it's too weird then Carl will pick it up and 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 tell us I think in this particular instance because you've put dual thought after the end of it or or a thing to say that this is one of her thoughts. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a, an exception to putting mm -hmm. it on a separate line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in in this case, the uh, the dashes sort of separate it instead mm -hmm. of separating it into a line. But other than that, that was great. I uh, I got I don't know if you could tell halfway through the reading, I got a bit excited and my <laughs> I sped up a little bit. It was like, oh, hang on, slow oh, wait, down. There's more. <laughs> and this one's a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, label him. Keep it simple here. Half no, she thought. So yeah, uh, I was uh, as you were reading, and and as I was reading yesterday, uh, the how to present the thoughts uh, has crossed my mind, and I'm I'm not sure which is the better way. But yeah, if if putting them on a separate line makes it better, then I will. Uh, when it comes to so so this is this is like a record for the record for the future uh, when when we manage to catch Carl for a uh, for a little direct dis discussion uh, then one layout issue that I kind of want to sort out is how to best present uh, the mm, the the sort of computer lines or or solitaire thinking or the lines mm -hmm. of code because I don't want to start introducing too many mm, too many extra characters like okay I we could put some sort of graphic element in there but uh, there was this good point in the uh, what what was the blog post that I that I respawned yesterday? Sixty one advice points, something something mm. something that I, I think Derek Mur Murphy had gathered them, and uh, one author or advisor or editor or whomever they uh, there was a bunch of them uh, said that uh, it's it's best not to rely on visual cues too much. So I, I think uh, using the italics is appropriate when uh, when differentiating between the sort of inner thoughts and uh, and computer speech but uh, but that's about as far as we can go that that's mm -hmm. about as reliable as it gets so so yeah that's that's one thing to discuss when uh, i think if we or when we uh, when we take a look back to the chapter 1 to 4 uh, then we can already present this question, and also uh, 
a related question uh, with layout is what to do with intents in these cases because okay I get it there is the industry standard that when you start a new paragraph then you put the little mm. in the beginning of the line however that little only uh, only makes reading better if it's followed by an actual paragraph but if it's a line of dialogue or a line of thought then for me it's actually distracting so it might be something that that is an industry standard but a standard I don't agree with <laughs> 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 and and another another point that I picked up from the uh, from the 61 advice points was that do not put uh, empty lines after a paragraph because that creates too much uh, space or, or like for an e-reader it makes the text longer which means more more tapping more poking but that's another uh, good idea that I don't agree with because okay if it's if it's if it's if it's paragraphs that go together sure I will keep them together of course I will try to make it so that if the paragraphs uh, belong together then they are a one they they are together as one paragraph mm -hmm. <laughs> so so uh, for me the formatting or the the layout of the text already sort of reflects the scene flow so basically when a paragraph ends proper then a scene ends and I, I want like an extra sort of <laughs> breather yeah there. So, so this is. I, I think. I think we can. Uh, we can sort of go over the whole text with the. Uh, with that singular idea in mind. That okay. Does a scene end here? If it does, then yes. Let's keep uh, uh, an empty line. If if it's if it's a scene that's going on, then uh, then do the more traditional approach. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> uh, uh, as you know, uh, I very much uh, enjoy uh, watching the channel of uh, Francina Simone, and I also followed her on Twitter. And uh, and one day she said something along the lines that she's the copy editor's worst nightmare because she makes up grammar. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I either replied or retweeted it. Yes, purpose before format, yo. <laughs> because uh, because uh, industry standard uh, is a nice thing, and it makes like industry standard is basically a visual trope, mm. or, or like or a collection of vis visual tropes. You, it it helps you to navigate the text. However. If I have a very, very, very clear idea about the purpose of something, uh, then I, 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 I fall into the uh, making up my own grammar <laughs> to fulfill a purpose camp quite firmly, and the same goes for punctuation. And and sometimes I can reconcile that with the sort of uh, industry standard. <laughs> but but sometimes I'm l I I will say like no it is supposed to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> I right. have decided. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what the original point was I no longer remember. Mm. When we're talking about, uh, I mean for e-reader format and reducing the amount of empty lines. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when I used to write on the forum, it was all... I didn't know what a paragraph was, mm -hmm. you know? If, yep. a, if a new character started talking, I might go to a different line, but I'd never leave an empty space. It was all just one big mm -hmm. block of text. And then over time, that became really difficult to read. Mm -hmm. So you'd go back and read through it, and it'd be just mm -hmm. like... this. It's hard. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, so I sort of taught myself to put the empty lines in. Like, I read other books and saw how they were doing <laughs> it, and... You know, but I didn't. That's that's where my my formatting comes. Like you see, I never do any of the indents, or I never. If I write a thing, and the best you're going to get out of me is paragraphs, and and that's it. I'm not going to do indents. I'm not going to do like 
headers and footers, page numbers, all this sort of stuff. I just write mm. the thing. Because I don't really understand all that. Mm. I don't. I know. I, I understand that there needs to be indents, and I know. I understand that there needs to be sort of for different formats. Then the the document needs to be set out in different ways. Mm. But it just. I I don't know. It looks neat the way we do it. You know. Yeah. So. And uh, I guess many industry people probably won't agree, but uh, I would say there is nothing inherently valuable about indents. It is mm. a convention that people have gotten used to, and, and indeed, those who are used to it, uh, for them, it helps to follow the text. But if the text can just as clearly be followed a different way, then th that purpose <laughs> has been fulfilled by, by an equal means, and yeah. the, other mean, uh, the other means are not uh, inherently more valuable than that. Uh, but yes, speaking of... Uh, personal perception bias I think that my uh, copywriting uh, copywriting and and uh, quote unquote script writing influences the way I see text is that I, I am already thinking in in sort of in uh, smallish uh, structural units and uh, and the text flow has to follow those mm -hmm. units because uh, in my day day job or civilian job, what I would what I would often have to do or or the output that I had to do was to write on a scene or a screenful basis. There would be text which would be read as audio and alongside it there would be some sort of animation or picture or whatever so so there would be what's happening on the screen and what is said in the audio and uh, and uh, I'm sort of used to putting everything together that way and I, I realize that it doesn't necessarily apply to the fiction text all the time everywhere but I don't know it's just some some of some of it uh, some of it carries on right well. Uh, I mean, some of it carries over to this type of text uh, rather well, I think. Yeah. The other element of it, of course, is I tend to write in three paragraphs what you can write in one. <laughs> So there's there's an element of the separation doesn't need to be there because these three paragraphs that were originally se separated is now one paragraph that's all it's one unit. Yeah, you one, know, and it one just thought, flows one nicely. Scene, one one uh, one purpose. Yeah. So that's the other element of it. You've got, you know, mm -hmm. removing stuff just makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I don't just remove it, I will also violently smash it together and crush it yep. and, and stick it into the crevices and, and all <laughs> that. Right, I, I but aren't otherwise I did pick up some places where I could have read it better, but I think, uh, I think let's leave it for Carr to pick up because he, he will pick up so much uh, stuff anyway, so... I think it is it is clear enough at this point. I got halfway through and I was like, wait, should I have should I have stopped after reading like certain sections so we could have discussed this? <laughs> and then it was just like, well, you're halfway through now, just keep going and if it's a problem we can talk about it later. <laughs> and I think we were picking up occasionally like you were green highlighting mm. most of the stuff that mm. I was I was struggling on a little bit. Yeah, nice. Chapter 7. So, I will wrap up this recording. This was mm -hmm. Chapter 7. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> I'm afraid the Chapter 7 won't provide too many snippets, behind the scenes snippets, because, uh, because it was already pretty 
this version was already pretty uh, pretty solidified and the other discussion got lost in uh, <laughs> in the ether but yeah chapter 7 see you soon bye